Welcome back. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, session now. We're changing gears, obviously. Um, we've had uh, this morning a really good conversation around uh, the economic outlook broadly. Uh, and one of the themes that came up was uh, politics. And so it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, to the stage to have a conversation with us about policy and politics. Um, Zoe Daniel, the Federal Independent Member for Goldstein, uh, Allegra Spender, who will be joining us on screen, and Dr Monique, oh, sorry, who of course is the Member for Wentworth, and Dr Monique Ryan, um, who is the Independent Member for Kuyong. Thank you. Hello, nice to be here. Us. And we'll wait for hopefully Allegra to pop up on screen. Oh, I hope you can hear me. Ah, here we go. Welcome. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. Hopefully you caught the, the quick uh, sort of intro that I was doing, but we've just, as I said, had this um, interesting conversation around the big economic challenges facing Australia. And one of the issues that came up in that conversation was the inability to get traction on policy, uh, particularly uh, in, at the federal level. Uh, and I think we're going to hear some great insights from each of you about that. And I think what the audience would really welcome is to get an understanding from you about the key policy issues that you think really matter and matter to you and the country, uh, but also how you're sort of getting um, engagement on those issues uh, in the community and in parliament. Uh, both individually and collectively. And um, I might um, start with you, Allegra, just so we don't forget that we've got you on screen. Okay. Uh, look, um, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm sorry I couldn't be there personally. Um, look, you know, I was absolutely uh, with um, my colleagues uh, voted in, in Wentworth to stand up for, you know, key issues in relation to climate, in relation to integrity, um, and in relation to a more diverse parliament that better reflects the country. Um, but also very much on the idea of long-term decision making, um, with it, with, also within the economic sphere. And so for me, while I've focused, you know, on how to make the climate policy better and hold the government to account on, in that area in particular, um, and work with colleagues around integrity measures. I've probably spent um, I've probably spent more time in than others perhaps on focusing on particularly tax and productivity and IR. Really, because I think that these are some of the conversations that we haven't been able to have because of I think the politicisation and the the wedging that goes on between the major parties, which means that so often we actually don't have the more thoughtful, complicated, and nuanced um, policy debates that we really do need to do um, if we are going to address um, you know our long term economic. Um, health, um, particularly in relation to productivity. Uh, so that's, um, you know, what I'm trying to do is make a virtue of being on the crossbench and the ability you have on the crossbench, you know, not to have to rule in, rule out at every um, second moment and say, okay, let's, you know, we're, we've started a conversation on tax, we've established roundtables, we've, um, you know, with academics, with um, business groups, with unions, with, you know, ACOS, with others, um, and said, okay, what are problems with our tax system? And, you know, we're, we're going to be releasing a green paper later in the year on tax in a way that, you know, I wish the major parties would get to, but, you know, because of this, the political climate, they haven't. And I think that's a great opportunity on the crossbench is actually to, to push those agendas um, in a way that, you know, I think the, the major parties have forgotten how to. Yeah. Um, Zoe? Yeah, I, I think Allegra and, and I think in a similar way uh, about these things. Um, perhaps the way that we prioritise our thinking is slightly different, but having been elected on pillars of climate, integrity, equality and prosperity, everything falls under those for me. Um, my thinking is really around the visionary arc, so not three-year terms, but where do we want to get to as a nation? One of the reasons I got into politics was because I don't think we have that. Uh, so all of my thinking and my actions in the parliament and indeed the conversations and actions in the community are about how we achieve uh, a robust, renewable, clean economy, how we achieve a more equal society and unlocking the potential of those cohorts that are not unlocked, specifically women, how we achieve appropriate governance and transparency and accountability in government and in business, and how we achieve intergenerational equity so that we leave something better for our kids. Um, and really, therefore, every action conversation in the parliament and outside it is to do with what levers 
can be used to achieve those things. Uh, Kate Cheney, our colleague, talks about nudging, uh, and it really is nudging. Uh, the nature of politics is that it works at glacial speed. Uh, there are a lot of roadblocks that you have to find your way around. So I think the learning over the last almost two years is how do you get things done? Uh, and we don't have the balance of power in the lower house, but I think that I can say that we have all achieved things by going through back doors and figure, figuring out how to do things even without the balance of power. Uh, and there's a lot more to do, but that's a work in progress. I'll, I'll come back to that observation on, on getting things done. Monique. Yes, can you hear me okay without the microphone? Yep, great, thank you. So I, I agree with the others. And one of the things that people find interesting about this expanded crossbench in the 47th parliament is the fact that we're all independent, but we are still able to work collaboratively uh, and constructively together. And that's something that people ask us about a lot, but it is something that we do. And I think it's important to note that we all come, those of us who are new to this parliament, come from lived experience in different industries, which I think really informs and helps the work that we're doing uh, both in our communities and in Canberra. So, you know, that for mine, yes, I was elected because of climate change and frustration with the government, previous governments in action on that. And I wanted integrity and transparency in government and I wanted greater equity. We talked in the uh, electoral process mainly about gender equity, but now more and more we've been looking at the issues of intergenerational inequity. For me, I come from a healthcare background and that's the industry that I know well. I was a medical researcher, so I understand scientific process. and as we sort of work out who does what, who takes on what, and how we address the, the really significant issues that the country have, is facing, I can see that I can have an impact on the care sector, because I get it. I've worked in healthcare and disability care for 30 years, and I understand what works and what doesn't, and that's where I feel that I can focus my activities. But we're all looking at things through the same lens, which is how to decarbonise our economy, how to you know make it more renewable and sustainable, and how to, ensure that the next generation is not the first Australian generation which is worse off than its predecessors. So we, we do come at it from different angles, but it's very complementary. And the way that we work together, I think, I, I think is, is very effective. Mm. Just a reminder to the audience, if you haven't already logged on, log on to ask your questions, the Pigeonhole app, you can do so off the QR code. We've got some questions rolling in, so also vote on the questions, uh, because I suspect there's going to be a few uh, coming through. Um, this issue about the way Canberra politics and Canberra operates um, and in the language that, that's already come up in terms of uh, long-term vision and the lack thereof, um, transparency, integrity, as distinct from the, the usual business of wedging and the politics, um, you know, is obviously something on everyone's mind, like how you get through that. In the previous session, uh, one of the ideas put was that four-year terms, uh, as a for instance, would be the way to go. I'm interested in your views on that, uh, but also perhaps just a little bit more colour about you know how how you actually uh, use your influence, um, and you are seen as as a group, but also have different um, individual sort of priorities and different individual. Um, constituencies that you have to um, communicate with and represent. So just interested in, in a, a little bit more on that and also the question on, on four-year terms. Um, Ali, do you want to kick off there? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we all, I mean, I certainly share some of the frustrations about how Canberra works. And at the same time, I think that it you know, certainly talking to people who have been in, in politics, in media for much longer than I have, they're saying, look, this parliament is actually one of the one of the better ones. It's actually really, it's moved both in terms of its culture, but also, um, you know, in terms of how it treats different people, it's, it's inclusivity. So I think while I feel um, we have a long way to go, I feel like we're already starting to have an impact. Uh, to jump to four year terms, first off, um, you know, I, I very support, very much support for your terms, but I also don't believe it's panacea. And, you know, I'd look at the state governments to say they're not bastions of perfect long term thinking and um, and administration and, and competence to say that that is the only way 
um, to achieve real accountability and effective you know, government and decision making. Um, I think that um, we've got to look at other things. And you know, for me, this is about a constant renewal of democracy. Um, and, and that's, I think, to be honest, where the crossbench is really great. You know, you look at institutions that I think are really important, such as the Parliamentary Biz, um, Budget Office, um, the um, NAC, you know, which Helen Haynes really championed. And it's it's actually looking at what are the institutional responses as well as the cultural changes. You know, and I, and I think from an institutional response piece, um, I think the pressure that, you know, others like Monique are playing in terms of, you know, pressuring around, you know, um, uh, um, making sure that we understand who's in the room, um, sort of from lobbying, you know, Helen's work on, um, for instance, uh, you know, how to make greater accountability in terms of, you know, government spending. Those things, I think, are really important to have, um, you know, sort of some institutional responses, but also, you know, having, um, I think, culturally, you know, we all have responsibility to, you know, consider how we speak, how we act, how we weigh into conversations, and how do we do that in a way that keeps on bringing the country together, um, rather than dividing. And certainly that's, you know, how I'm trying to do it. And I also think we need to constantly think about how can we do government differently? And, you know, I've been a champion of, for example, citizens assemblies, um, because um, as, as an idea of bringing randomly selected Australians together to debate um, and come to a consensus around difficult policy issues, not because they will always have the perfect answer, but because actually coming together, listening and building consensus is a very powerful, I think, counter to the the splitting, I think, um, that is so prevalent. But, um, you know, I've, I want to hear from my colleagues who have much more <laughs> thoughtful things to say, but those are some of my opening um, reflections on this. Monique, a bit, bit, a bit of your sort of perspective, I'm interested also in the sort of motivation for the who's in the room. Well, the, yes, yeah, so I think four-year terms would be good. I think fixed terms would be good. The reality is that if you're a politician, you spend the six months before any election preparing for that election and your um, attention will be away from the political process. I think we've, the plan is that the government's going to lodge 16 to 18 pieces of legislation in the last two weeks and I think this forthcoming week and then that's it. We've been told that that's it for the rest of the year, which is really problematic when you look at all the things that we haven't seen yet like legislation about gambling, advertising and the like, because it looks like we're not going to get to that before the next federal election, which is a bit heartbreaking for people like Zoe and Kate who have been working really hard on that. It's, it's a, a difficult thing. You can only do so many things at a time, but so much of our time is distracted by the electoral process that I think that anything that stretches that out would be good. Mm. Having said that, there are complexities associated with that in terms of how that impacts on the, on the Senate. Um, and, and their terms, and, and as Allegra said, it's not going to be a panacea for all ills. Um, the who's in the room question, it's, it's a pretty simple one. There's 15 lobbyists in Parliament House for every politician. Lobbying is important. We need to hear from our electorates and from other groups about things that matter to them and that we need to put action, you know, attention to. But when we don't, when, you know, when the government's making decisions about air routes, if you, if you like, and we don't know when they met with Qantas or Qatar or other um, airlines and, and about what and what the subject of that meeting was, it's a problem. It, it, it degrades, it's corrosive of trust in the system. And we know that our democratic process and the trust in it in this country is at a low and it's going to get worse with the increasing disinformation and misinformation that we're seeing, particularly from far right groups in like advance. We saw the effect of that in the referendum. It's going to be, I think, hideous in the next federal election because the government hasn't been able to act on things like truth and advertising laws. So if we can't get them across the line, we have to do what we can do to try and restore people's trust in the process. And one of the nice things about the crossbench is that we're working collaboratively to take different pieces of that puzzle. Um, next week, uh, Helen Haynes will be lodging a private member's bill about pork barrelling. You know, it's, it's another piece of the puzzle. Lobbying is a piece of the puzzle. The revolving door between ministerial and senior public servants' positions and industry is part of the problem. Every industry minister since 2001 has left politics and gone straight to a job in the industry. Now, that does not give people faith in the process of decision making and clarity around that. A uh, former Prime Minister going into a job in defence, working with Mike Pompeo, with whom he worked on developing the AUKUS agreement, $368 billion, does not give us 
faith in the process of defence procurements. You know, there's, those are all things that we need to work on. Um, they're not things that the opposition are working on. And so the opposition, the crossbench has picked them up and we're working on them. And I think we're working on them effectively. And we're bringing these things into the public consciousness and calling attention to them. And we have lots of opportunity to call attention to them because they pop up all the time. And that's one of the really important jobs that I think the crossbench is doing. Yeah. Zoe? Four year terms, sure. Uh, requires a referendum, so we all know how that goes. Um, I know the Prime Minister supports it, but it's simply not going to happen, so there's not much point talking about it. Um, three year, three <laughs> year uh, fixed terms, again, great. Um, but th three year terms shouldn't be an excuse for not having vision. I think that's the core of the problem. Governments need to be braver. And a key role of the expanding crossbench is to make them braver. There's in numbers, not in size. <laughs> well, there has been a bit of both, actually. But um, there, you know, there's several ways to skin a cat. Yeah. And you know, I've already alluded to the fact that we don't yet have the balance of power in the house, uh, but we've managed individually and you know through collective pressure to get the government to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Um, and to elevate issues that wouldn't have otherwise been elevated uh, into the public conversation. And a, a big part of what I think the crossbench can do is create social licence around issues and exert pressure uh, from community back to government on things like opening of ministerial diaries, transparency and, and oversight and appointments to government and regulatory organisations and what ministers do after they leave office and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and to raise things pointedly like banning gambling advertising that neither of the major parties will do because they're reliant on funds from gambling companies. Um, so we find ways around the system uh, to either amend legislation by pushing things up to the Senate if we can't get it through the House or making an argument to government around changing policy. I think one thing that's been useful in not having the balance of power in this iteration of the parliament is that there's no transaction involved. When one of us goes to a government minister and says there's a gap in your law here or your policy, this has to be fixed, the conversation is not well, I need your vote, so what do you want me to do? The conversation is making an argument, a solid argument for the change that needs to be made. So it becomes more of an intellectual process rather than a transactional process. So no matter what happens with the arithmetic after the next election, we've built that. We've built the ability to do that. And personally, I'd like to get away from that transactional politics of I need your vote, so what do you want? Um, and particularly coming from an electorate like mine and, and the others are similar, where it's different to, say, being Jackie Lambie, who goes in and says, Tasmania needs this and for, for my vote I need you to do this. And Jackie's quite open about that and Tasmania does need things. Mm. Um, but my electorate, although there is a level of need, has bigger picture thinking about visionary policy and they're the kind of actions that um, people want to see movement on and the expectations of me are to prosecute that big picture thinking and to force the government into a braver position and to communicate to them that this is what people want and your job is to do uh, what they want to secure a prosperous life for their kids. Yeah, that, that language about right. the sort of Oh, sorry, Allegra. I, um, I just want to add a couple of things um, to that. I think the point that Zoe just touched on in the end um, was about community, I think is actually really critical. And I think, you know, where did I come from? You know, where did, you know, Monique and Zoe came from? You know, we all came from community and are very, very connected to community. And you, you see that in the response to stage three tax cuts, which affected my electorate negatively more than any electorate in the country. Um, but it's actually sort of coming, getting, bringing politics back to, well, what does the community feel? Are they informed? How do they do that? I actually think that is an extremely powerful way of, of holding all governments to account. And also for, for all, the, all members of parliament to realise there's no such thing as a safe seat is again, extremely powerful as a motivator for politicians to be better connected um, to community. I think that is going to, you know, I think that's huge play for this, this piece. 
And and just the other point I wanted to make was, um, you know, when it comes to um, dealing with some difficult issues, and I'll use Services Australia as an example, where we've had really bad service of Services Australia. You know, we've had I've had constituents saying they've been on the phone literally for two hours, um, waiting and then get chucked off. But the problem is the coalition can't go after the government on Services Australia because they will just say robo debt. And so because they've all been in power, you can always just call each other's hypocrisy on an issue. But because we, you know, we haven't had that situation, we can sit there and say, you know what, I'm not, I don't have an axe to grind, a, a legacy to defend. I can just say my community has had it with this, this level of service and you need to do something about it. And, you know, we really pushed the government minister to, and the whole crossbench actually in the house got behind um, a push on this and, and saw, you know, the government it, um, make a significant additional investment. And so I just think that's that kind of having that clean skin, but also that um, community link is a is you know something I think in politics in this country we really need to build on because it also helps our social cohesion and also people feeling they've got a stake in politics, um, which means that you know they they will be more engaged and actually you know our citizens are our best defenders I think of our democracy. And I think sitting within what you just said too is just a, a recognition of the relationship with the community, not the transaction with the community. Which I think, if I sort of think about pork barreling, so you know, so much in the past seems to have been about this transactional piece around one term, one election. But I think what you're sort of talking about is understanding the community and building the relationship with the community and having them feel heard, and then bringing that into the conversation in in a constructive way um, is sort of a, a really powerful message. But I want to join a couple of things here to pick up on the two top questions. So number one, this point about a visionary arc is really resonating. We, you know, the language that, that we're starting to use at CEDA is about being sustainably brave. You know, how do you drive these long-term persistent policy changes that you need to see that aren't going to be in a, in a straight line? Um, but also you talked about legacy, right? And so the question is, is really about, you know, how do you, how do you drive this mammoth task of the visionary arc? How do you bring other stakeholders into it? And to link it to the legacy question, the second question is around, or was, it's just moved, but just the immediate sort of rejection of carbon pricing um, as, as a, an approach to dealing with decarbonisation. And of course, there is legacy and lots of, you know, axes to grind there. Who wants to pick up, you know, like as, with that as an example, is it something that you can, can lean into? Um, how are you thinking about that? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um... And I'll, I'll kind of start with the general and then I'll, I'll let the other two go to the specifics. But I think that, you know, one thing that's very liberating about being a, an independent member of the crossbench is that you're not beholden by party politics or the position of your party on anything. And therefore, you can step out a lot further on things. And you've seen, you know, Allegra's stepped out on tax reform, um, Mon is, you know, really pushing this accountability around lobbying and each of us have our, our piece of that. Um, and so on something like carbon pricing, I mean, I think we're all on board with the everything on the table tax reform idea and carbon pricing has to be part of that. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I'm going to prosecute the idea of a carbon price because I know that'll be on the front page of The Australian tomorrow if I, I say that. But the thing is, I'm also not going to sit here and say we don't need it because I think most reasonable people would say that's the obvious pathway. Um, the two major parties won't do it or don't want to do it for political reasons, not for economic reasons, not for pragmatic reasons, just because there's sort of post-traumatic stress around what happened last time. And that's a real limitation to forward-thinking policy-making. And, you know, one of our functions is to call that out at, at every level across the board. And, you know, just before I hand over to one of the others, you know, in terms of the sort of visionary arc and, and visionary thinking, you know, one thing is to sort of prosecute that bravery with whoever's in, in government and almost enable that national conversation to allow them to step into things that they otherwise wouldn't. Because once you start enabling a national conversation around something and the major parties go, oh, actually, this is landing quite well, maybe we can step into this, that, then you start getting forward movement. Um, but then, of course, there's also the practical levers. And, you know, one of my big 
policy focuses is uh, economic empowerment of women. And so really, I'm just going through every piece of legislation adding a gender lens. So economic, you know, gender equality in the objects of the Fair Work Act, tick. A gender lens over Jobs and Skills Australia legislation, tick. Uh, consideration of venture capital into female-led companies in the National Reconstruction Fund, tick. You know, next, 52 weeks of paid parental leave, superannuation on paid parental leave, the ability for women to top up their superannuation when they return from paid parental leave, universal early childhood education and care to enable 50% of the uh, workforce to actually step in properly. These are the kinds of practical levers that we can begin to utilise. So, you know, there's a, a sort of range of ways, as I've previously said, of getting the government to move forward on whatever it is that we're working on. Monique? So, yeah, I think that's really important. And the, the courage piece is really important because, as Zoe said, the, the parties are driven by political imperatives. We are to a much lesser extent. We're not queer politicians and we're independents. But we can help the parties get social licence for these sorts of initiatives. And recent experience was the stage three tax cuts. And we were independents, we're on different it came from different positions around the statutory tax cuts. But I was pretty um, convinced last year that we needed to modify the statutory tax cuts. And the government wasn't going to do that. But what we saw was that various people talking about the need for it, whether it was economists, experts, social groups, politicians, came at them from different angles, talked to our communities, got the feedback that the communities were open to that discussion. And in fact, communities like mine and the others in the end, you know, when we, when we asked them, they said, even the people who were going to be most affected by them in a negative way said, look, we understand that that's going to cost us, but it's the right thing to do. And it gave the government the social licence to do that. So what we saw was a whole lot of no, 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 yes. Mm. And I think that we'll see that with other things as well. The politics is that will you rule that in, will you roll that out? It's so, it's so toxic. It, it just blows up every debate immediately. Everyone gets really nervous about it and sort of digs in because you don't want to be wedged politically. But if there's an ongoing discussion about it, which is held in a respectful, collaborative, positive way over time, people hear these words, these phrases, I'm not going to say them because it'll be on the front, as, as Paul said, it'll be on the front page of The Australian tomorrow. There's quite a few different bits of tax policy in this country which are open for discussion and which should be discussed, but we can perhaps talk about them, put them on the agenda, talk to our communities about them, get feedback from our communities, take that to the government and say, look, people aren't that scared. They understand that this change or that change as part of a, a reform package is a reasonable thing to consider. Yeah. And so, yeah, yes, it's raised by various people and it gets shot down immediately, but we can bring it back again and, and hopefully foster uh, discussions about it, which will help the political parties understand that they do potentially have the ability to take action on these really important issues. So Allegra, this is this has given me the fantastic sort of Dorothy Dixon for, for you, because I mean, talk about Phoenix from the ashes. Um, you know, the Ken Henry white paper, tax reform, um, you know, star, little star for you for the bravery in prosecuting this agenda again. Um, you know, what do you think you're going to do differently this time and, you know, to sort of att attack this legacy issue? <laughs> I think partly, um, I think partly in life, you know, you, you know, you big things take time. And so, you know, to accept not everything happens overnight and to be part of, you know, for, for me, my goal is to be part of a way which, and, you know, you stand on the shoulders of everybody else and they stand on your shoulders too. Like nobody, I don't think it's about one person making a change. And, and that's probably the broader theme I have, which is that if you want to make change, if you want to be brave, you want people behind you. You know, I'm, I've had moments where I feel very afraid and it's actually having people there who say, no, you can do it, who are backing you and backing you publicly, that gives you the bravery to make a choice that is hard and you know, even making the choice to run. It was actually having those people behind me that made the difference. And so for me, the question on how do you build sustainable braveness and um, get over legacy is actually about building coalitions. So, you know, how do you work with, you know, the business groups, the unions, the, there's others, or, you know, it depends on the issue, obviously, but that is, you know, you, you build a coalition 
And then you also get people across this and, you know, you, you, you start from understanding what, what are people's concerns about this, take those seriously and come back to them and then and see if you can find um, areas of common ground. And if you look at the great reforms that we have had, firstly, there have been a couple of goes at them. I mean, look at GST, you know, mm. Keating sort of wanted to do it, you know, got ruled out. You know, John Hewson lost an election over it. And, you know, and then it took John Howard to come in. Like these, you know, those big changes are hard. Um, but, you know, and you don't always get them on the, on the first, first run. You know, I hope that we have a price on carbon and a, a broad price on carbon, I think, is the right price. You know, whether it's a tax, whether it's expanding the safeguard mechanism to and, you know, bringing in all the different and trading mechanisms, you know, that is the right decision if we're going to move as fast and as cost effectively um, as we can. So we should absolutely have this. And, you know, I said we need a price on carbon, we still need one. And, you know, I, I, you know I'm still, you know, it's it's okay. And I think the more that we say this, the more that people go, yeah, you know what, there's a, there's a good reason for this. So, you know, people, you know, the world has changed even since, you know, since Gillard times on carbon price. You know, you look at you know, the BCA used to be the biggest um, sort of anti-carbon action. In the last election, you know, they were brave in the sense that they actually reversed their position from the previous election and say, you know what, it's better for this country to take action than not. And so I think that's what we need to, you know, to, to say and to foster is that it is better to make the right decision. And sometimes you made the right decision, but it's too early. You know, you've got to, you can't be afraid of coming back to it. And I think that's the opportunity of the crossbench, but actually it's opportunity of, of people um, like yourselves and everybody in the room. You know, you guys all have that power to bring that conversation back and say, you know what, just because you've had it before doesn't mean we need to have it again. Yeah, yeah, a good challenge for us as well. Um, throughout a lot of your introductory comments, I think from each of you, there is a reference to intergenerational equity. Um, keen to sort of understand um, what that looks like and what, what you think the priorities are and, and I guess really the interest of your electorates in sort of driving this, this change and this focus as well, Monique? Yeah, so it's, it's a real problem and for, I guess for mine I think, you know, our tax system is, um, it, it favours people with established wealth uh, and it disadvantages younger people who are, you know, they're the ones who are generating income and paying income tax at, to a higher degree um, than other parts of this economy. Then they've got the challenges of housing availability and affordability. They've got the cha challenges of a narrowing tax base with an ageing population, which is going to need more and more aged care. And then they've got the challenges mm. of climate, the remediation and um, action on climate change. So, you know, it, it looks like a, a triple whammy. And then they've got HEX. So, you know, you look at the 20 and 30 year olds and they're coming in and they're really just pulling their hair out and trying to understand how they're going to make things meet. And, you know, and, and, and you can see the inequity. I mean, Ken Henry called it out in his report and we haven't done anything effective on it since that time to any significant extent. And, you know, it's gotten worse. So they're all things that we need to work on. Yeah, you know, all, all, all those things I just listed are things that we need to look at, governments need to look at and take action on to uh, shore up the futures for uh, the next generation. And my electorate is an electorate which has changed. You know, it's been looked upon as a traditional blue ribbon, conservative, liberal electorate. It's not that anymore. If it was, I wouldn't be here. Uh, it is a, a part of the world where there's increased medium density housing. There's, there's, there's increased young people, but there's more and more young people as well. And I've got two at home who are young adults who can't afford to, to move out of home and they can't afford to rent or to buy. And they're struggling with hex debts. They're, they're not, you know, young people aren't completing their first degrees and they're scared to go on to another degree because they're just going to accumulate more debt and they don't know how they're going to pay it back. You know, there's all this sort of, it's a triple, quadruple whammy situation and it's up to us to fix it for them. Mm. Sorry, anything to add? Uncertainty, instability and inequality. That's what our young people are facing. And not only at a sort of domestic economic level, particularly in relation to housing, but also with climate change hanging over them and uncertainty around what the future looks like. And that means that, to Allegra's point, we need to 
look at things that have been brought forward and have been politically unpalatable in the past and consider, well, maybe community attitudes to these things have changed. Certainly under Gillard during the sort of carbon tax era and also Bill Shorten's aspirations around things like negative gearing, those were shot down for political reasons and perhaps the community wasn't ready for those things. But my sense is on both of those things, there's been substantial movement in community attitudes because the vast majority of people understand that we're in a cr climate crisis and understand that we're in a housing crisis and understand that we have to change things to manage those things for our kids, our, our grandkids and the future of our environment um, and our economic prosperity. So sometimes it it takes almost a, a generation to achieve these kinds of policy shifts and that gets back to our issues with short-term political thinking that once something has failed politically the major parties just go oh well that's shelved we can never even utter the word negative gearing again in a policy speech um, but if we don't start to address these issues the people who will pay are our kids mm -hmm. and you know i mean i was very reluctant to run for Parliament and it was my son who said to me, someone's got to do something for us, Mum. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if there's no other reason to be here, that's it. And I remind myself of that every day. Um, I'm going to move on to one for a final question. I knew we were going to run out of time um, and I'm trying to figure out how I can pull together threads from about five different questions to come at this final question. But it goes to the issue of culture. Um, and culture change, which I think sits around sort of all of this in terms of, and I think you spoke about it, each of you, in, in different ways in your opening comments. Um, one of the questions in here reminds us that you're sort of referred to as the prefix uh, in Canberra. I, I would personally own that if I were you. But, but there's also a question that goes to the fact that you're not career politicians, you come from different sectors. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to bundle these together to get a perspective on how important that is to changing the, the culture of the way things are done in Canberra. And I guess maybe for our audience, there's going to be some lessons in this as they're trying to be, to drive change or innovation in their own organisations, what it feels like to be that, that different voice. Um, can I start with you, Allegra, to manage that big elephant of a question? <laughs> a huge one. Um, look, for me, actually, it really is important. Um, one of the things I think is the biggest challenge in politics is you become so distant, um, you know, when you're in Parliament from the issues that affect people day to day. You know, you get these wadges of legislation, but what really matters is how it affects people. And that is why I think we actually, um, in different ways, we need to bring the community more closely into Parliament. And that I think you can do that through both through sort of having much more strong community links as politicians, but also through having, you know, different people with different experiences in the room who, who come at this with some of that lived experience and still remember what it was like to be on the receiving end um, of a wodge of legislation rather than, than just being a drafter or an advisor to it. Um, and so, you know, I'll use IR, I used to run a a, you know, fashion business and a different not-for-profit. So every lens I look at sort of through industrial relations is sort of saying, okay, how does this work practically if I'm running a business? How does this work for my workers? You know, and 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 I think that that piece is is pretty pretty important. So I think that is, you know, how to to do that's pretty is is vital because on the other point that we're talking about, which is making fundamental change. Politicians generally aren't brave. They will do things that their communities want them to do. Um, and so if we can, you know, the, so the big thing is actually how do you help, back, you know, empower those communities and communities have a stronger voice if then politicians will do more of, of the things that they, they want them to do. So I think we have to always keep on coming back to community, pushing from the community up, then has a huge, huge opportunity. So um, and in terms of people, so, you know, and, and I, lastly, for people who are doing policy, make it real. Like the hardest thing in politics is, you know, particularly on, say, productivity, is to turn it from a buzzword or an economist kind of word to something that actually means something to a voter. And I think that's got to be, I think that's all of our jobs, not just the politicians' jobs, you know, to always come back to what is the impact on somebody's life about this and how to tell a story um, so that we can both through our heads understand it, but also through our hearts. Sorry, that's a bit of a blah, blah, but I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it to my colleagues to wrap it up beautifully. <laughs> Monique? 
Well, I think the cultural thing is really interesting. And, you know, the culture of Parliament House is an interesting thing, which has been under the focus in recent weeks in particular. All we can do as um, representatives of our communities is to try and represent our communities as, as best we can. In terms of the prefects thing, I was not a prefect. <laughs> I was a bit naughty. Um, but, and, and I have a tendency in Parliament House when it gets like really adversarial and uh, I want to join in. Yeah. But I'm lucky because Allegra sits next to me and she was a head girl. <laughs> and she says to me, no, 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 mom, don't do it. You know, don't get caught up. And it is really, it would be really easy in that place to get caught up in it. But really, we sort of have to take it back to first principles. As Allegra said, why are we there to represent our communities? You know, not to get into argy-bargy with people who are putting out nasty tweets about you. So that's really important. But the more of us who are there and who are trying to, you know, the Michelle Obama thing, when they go low, we go high. It's not always easy, but if we can go high, it, it'll, it'll, it'll represent our communities better, but it will also improve the, the tenor of the conversation. So what, what we really want is a government which is evidence-based, looks at the science, makes the right decisions for the, the, the country as a whole, rather than the decisions that are best for that political party. And I guess if we can do that, then that will speak to the question of our legacy, but also the durability of this model. It's not going to be easy, but if we can do it, it'll be an incredibly valuable contribution. Now I know why they're calling you prefix, if you bring that framing to it. Zoe, the final word in 30 seconds or less? <laughs> uh, look, I think our, our role is to restore trust. Um, and I think that's actually the central thing that's missing. And we do that by putting people first, putting community first, and by being real and speaking the truth. That can be hard. That, that can be quite challenging. We get cut down, all of us, we get cut down every day by doing that. But if we can begin to restore trust in leadership by playing a role which is creating accountability, transparency, bringing reality and some standards back, to politics, we we will have done our job. And if there was one umbrella theme when I was running before the election, it was lack of trust and the need for integrity in politics. And so that underpins everything. And that goes to the kind of bravery that we need to show. Um, and the thing is that in many ways, it's courage before confidence. You know. We can never feel completely confident in everything that we're doing. Um, and I'm sure all of you as leaders know that sometimes you step into something and you think, oh, God, am I really doing this? Um, but someone has to step out. Um, someone has to take that first step to bring everyone else along. And I think that's the role that we play. Oh, that's a fantastic way to end this um, session. Certainly a lot that um, aligns with what we're trying to do at CEDA. And I have heard the challenge about the role for us to be uh, braver and more courageous in supporting um, the, the endeavour of the, the sort of visionary arc. So um, can you join me in thanking our panellists?